Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Today I wanted to talk about tradition versus the wisdom of this world. I was doing my studies with the Lord and came across Matthew chapter 16. So it would be kind of like an expository study, but I want to focus on traditions of men and the wisdom of this world. Wisdom of men. Basically being followers of men and not followers of God. So we're going to turn to Matthew 16 verse 1. It's a little windy today. Uh, if you hear some noises sometimes, the uh, hummingbirds are, some of them are very dominant. They have charge of the hummingbird feeder, so sometimes they'll be making noise. And um, We're hoping the first take goes well. I'm still having, I have an old camera, so I don't have the mic yet. And I'm looking for something where I can get a mic, so then I won't have to worry too much about the wind. Maybe even be able to do some on the beach, videos on the beach. But Matthew 16, verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. This is Jesus Christ. Ta uh, they're talking to Jesus Christ. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. But first, let's talk about Pharisees and Sadducees. Okay? What represents a Pharisee? We turn to Matthew 15, 1. We're going to go through all the way to chapter, uh, verse 9, Matthew 15, 1 verse through verse 9. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. I'm going to throw this in there. One of the commands that we're given today is, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can't rightly divide the word of truth if you're going outside the Bible to get words and phrases and, and terms and stuff. Uh, verse 4. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whoever shall say to his father or mo his mother, it is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightst be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Then in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now notice there in verse 6, Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. What's the commandment of God? Uh, it's all about His Word. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You're not to add to or subtract from the word of God. So they made the commandment of God of none effect by their traditions. And, uh, and all throughout this study I'll be mentioning it. Uh, Godhead versus the Trinity. The Trinity make, um, right there is the big thing about the Trinity. They have made the commandment of God of none effect by their tradition with the Trinity. It's all about the traditions of men. It's all about using words of men and philosophy. Uh, post and mid-trib, they've got to go away from the Word of God. And it's based off of tradition. You know, it was never, uh, pre-time of Jacob's trouble was never taught before John Nelson Darby. It's all about traditions of men that he used to attack absolute truth. And they use their traditions to do it also. Well, it's always been this way. Sometimes that's a lie, but people can use traditions to try to overthrow the Word of God, major doctrines in the Word of God. Uh, as we're going to see here, the Pharisees, they hold traditions above the Word of God. They don't deny the Word of God, they just hold traditions above the Word of God, so it's a word game. They're, they are denying the Word of God when they hold the traditions above but you notice it said there that with their lips, oh yeah, this is still God's word and everything. But then the traditions of men, we're going to use the word Trinity, God in three persons, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's not in the Bible. 
Although we're Bible believers, but you know what? The traditions of men, men have always said it this way. Men have always accepted this term. Uh, that's what Pharisees did. Okay? They'd hold traditions above the Word of God. Uh, verse 7, the hypocrites. I think we went through all this. Yeah, draweth nigh. Uh, verse 8, draweth nigh unto me with their mouths. Oh yeah, we're Bible believers. Oh yeah, God's Word's pretty good. It's pretty good. But then their traditions always usurp them. The Word of God. The biggest people today is the Catholic Church. Their traditions trump the Word of God. The Word of men outweigh the Word of God. You're to listen to the Word of men. But we're going to get to the Sadducees here in a second. But in vain do they, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Doctrines command of men. And notice it says they worship me in vain, that vain they do worship me. These people who stand for the Trinity, uh, they, they worship a false god, but they think they're worshiping the real god, but they're worshiping a false god, and they're doing it in vain. It's all vain. Vanity of vanities. <laughs> Turn to Matthew 23, 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Okay. One of the big things about the Pharisees also wasn't just that they held the traditions of men above the word of God. They put themselves up here, and you're down here. Nicolaitans, I think that's the right one. They put themselves up here, and you're down here. That's another aspect of the Pharisees. Uh, do as I say, not as I do. Verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. A good example, once again, is these Trinity teachers, false teachers out there. They'll attack us saying, we're not Bible believers, we're not Bible believers, and we need to be Bible believers. Yet they, they themselves aren't following the Bible. They'll go outside the Bible whenever they please. But if we go outside the Bible teaching something they don't like, they'll hammer us left and right. See, he's going outside the Bible. See, he's not a Bible believer. Yet when we tell them, Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. God in three persons is not in the Bible. You're supposed to obey the Bible. They don't have to follow their own rules. Pharisees, that's what they are. And they try to claim that we that stand for the King James Bible are Pharisees. They have no clue. Or they do, they're purposely trying to deceive you and trying to change. One of the biggest things in my ministry is they're always trying to change definitions in the Bible to suit their purpose. To use the new definitions to attack true Bible-believing Christians. True definition of a Pharisee. They hold traditions of men above the Word of God, and they are held to a higher, they're, they're higher up, so the, all the rules don't always apply to them. They can break the rules, and it's okay. Verse 5, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their um, phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the other uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Uh, a lot of these Babel buildings, uh, you'll see that a lot about the dress and everything. Um, having to wear a suit and tie. Uh, I had someone <laughs> attack me saying, do you wear a nice suit and tie to show respect to the Lord? And I'm like, I threw the story about Peter in the boat. He's naked in the boat because it's so hot. He's got his garment beside him. They're fishing. It's just men around. And He's, he realizes it's Jesus on the shore, and what does he do? Oh, i got to get on my suit and tie. No, he just grabs his clothes, throws his waist around him, and he jumps in and swims to Jesus as he is. Okay? Jesus is not as God, the Father, because there's only one God, the Father. If Jesus isn't the Father, he's not God. And God is not a respecter of persons. Verse 7, and greetings in the marketplace, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, 
But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. You're not supposed to have titles, period. Okay? That's another thing. I am Brother Philip, Philip, Mr. Newton. <laughs> Some people, I don't know if that's that whole thing. I still try to say Mrs. and Mr. to people that I don't really know well as respect. But I think that kind of being a gentleman that way has kind of gone out the window. You don't hear people say Mr. So-and-so that much anymore. Unless it's a business, but I'm talking about just in passing with people. But you're not to have a title. It's not pastor, it's not doctor, it's not um, PhD this. I mean, it's just, you're just, I'm Brother Philip. Even Christ. And all ye are brethren. That's back to what I just said. <laughs> I'm, I'm Brother Philip, that's it. Verse 9. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Uh, a lot of the titles in the Catholic Church, you know, are, are wrong, are, you know, it's wrong, but a lot of them are twisting scripture and perverting things. You don't have titles. Ten, neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I do this for you. Um, I get I get stuff out of it by learning also the Lord's showing me stuff and learning and I get to share with you what God is showing me There's times I get to testify with you. I get to share testimonies of other people through the uh, The testimony and prayer request side of the ministry But most of the time mostly I'm doing this for you and I want to do it for the Lord Because uh, I want to be used more of him, but a lot of the Pharisees uh, It goes back to them being greatest you know, they have to say, Dr. So-and-so, you know, Pastor this, Reverend this, and Father so-and-so, you know. They have to be greatest among the people. There's only one great, and that's God. And whosoever shall exalt himself about, shall be abased. Part of that exalt, exalting, I think, today is the suit and tie. Yes, I'm not going to show up, if I was doing fellowship or a Bible study, I'm not going to show up in pants that are all holes in them and just like stinking to high heaven. I understand that. But if someone shows up in old jeans that are kind of faded a little bit and they're wearing a, you know, a t-shirt and they're poor, you don't know what the reasoning is behind them. You don't, you know, you don't say they should be exalting themselves. They should be dressing in suits and ties. Uh, that's not in the Bible. Uh, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Right? We've got to stay humble, brothers and sisters of Christ. Pharisees aren't. They're not humble at all. And there's a couple teachers out there that I mention every so often. They don't, they're not humble. They're not humble at all. They act all nice like a car salesman. And you know, and they're trying to be nice, and it's all about, you know, we all agree to disagree, and it's about what you think, and, you know, you got people like that, but they're still not humble. It's putting on a show. You call them out when they're doing teaching falsely and everything, and that, their fake humbleness goes out the window. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. I've noticed that in the Bible, that scribes and Pharisees usually go hand in hand, to a point where Pharisees hold traditions of men above the Word of God and they elevate themselves to being greater than everybody else. Um, and scribes, they hold themselves to being greater than everybody else. And they're the ones that dictate what God's Word says or doesn't say. In other words, they add to and subtract from the Word of God. So they still hold something, their wisdom, their PhD, the wisdom of the world, above the Word of God. Uh, what does it say? Verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entered to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! And they are. Uh, you got a lot of ministries out there that they're hypocrites. And don't get me wrong, sometimes I'll slip up and say one thing, and in another video I might slip up and say another, and it's a true brother and sister in Christ comes to me and says, Hey, you kind of said this. I'll do a correction video and say, Hey, I kind of slipped up here. It made me out to be a hypocrite. I just said it wrong. I didn't mean to. 
I'm, I'm sorry. I have no problem doing that. I stay humble. But for the most part, when it comes to main teaching, main doctrine, they're hypocrites. You can tell it left and right. For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. That's why I always push that prayer, your main prayer life is between you and the Lord. I'm not putting on a show in front of other people. You pray with your wife privately at home. You pray with, or you know, if you're out, but you pray with your wife, you pray with your kids. But most of your prayer life is going to be between you and the Lord. And there's five of them fighting. Fifteen. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. There's people that are branching off from false teachers that the false teachers are like, you know, the mark of the beast. Yeah, you, you shouldn't take the mark of the beast uh, in the time of Jacob's trouble. You'll lose your salvation and then, but you know, you, you might, you might not. And then they have a guy branches off from them that says, hey, I've learned so much from this false teacher and I want to start doing my own teachings. And now you got guys out there saying you can take the mark in your hand and then later on just chop your hand off. What does the Bible say here? You make one proselyte and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Telling people to take the mark of the beast and all you can just cut your hand off. What is that? You're trying to send people to hell by telling people they can take the mark and still be saved. Turn to Mark 2.16, last one for trying to describe Pharisees. So far the two things, tradition of men, and they elevate themselves to a higher status. We're above everybody. Okay, look at my suit and tie. Don't get me wrong, there's certain situations and occasions where if you want to wear a suit and tie, I have no problem with it. My problem is, is when it's expected of everybody to go to a pagan temple, they like to call church buildings, and telling everybody they're supposed to be wearing suit and ties. That's where it becomes, they're, they're trying to put on a show, and they're trying to exalt themselves. If you want to wear a suit and tie, I'm not against it. I used to love suit and ties, but I got burnt out on them because of the battle buildings. Mark 2.16, And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Why would they say this? Because they believe that they're above them. And if Jesus is some kind of prophet, this is from their attitude, if he's some kind of holy man and prophet like they are, he shouldn't be sitting with those people. He should act like them, traditions of men, that they're above the people. What's Jesus' response? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, the Pharisees, but sinners to repentance, self-righteousness. So you realize three things, we'll throw three things in there. Traditions of men, and I guess that's two parts. They hold themselves above men and they're self-righteous. Okay. They do no wrong. They're, and when they are wrong, you're just supposed to ignore it because they're above everybody else. They're above correction. Reproach, rebuke, correction, yep. So that's, that's the Pharisees we're going to be talking about because our main subject today is traditions of men and wisdom of men, wisdom of the world. And we're applying it mainly to the Godhead versus the Trinity, but that goes with any doctrine. They're going to just screw up everything. And their whole number one point is to pull you away from the Word of God. That's their point. They want you to have their, your eyes on them, not the Word of God. Sadducees, the biggest ones with the Sadducees. Ma uh, Matthew twenty two twenty three, Mark twelve eighteen. Uh, those two, I'm going to do Mark tw uh, Matthew twenty two twenty three. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, and they go in to try to deceive him with uh, Moses wrote a letter about a man he had no son, his brother is supposed to marry the, his wife and bear up seed. And they're trying to deceive him. But Sadducees, 
do not believe in the resurrection. Okay. Acts 23, 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angels nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. This is important real quick for two parts. Notice that if they find something in the Bible they don't like, they take it out. That's not, that's not true. It's not, that's not true at all. If there's something they want, they put it in. Trinity's not in the Bible, the King James Bible. So anybody who professes to be a King James Bible believer but keeps using the word Trinity and not Godhead, they're not a Bible believer. Biggest example is you look at a lot of the new Bible perversions that are coming out, they're taking Godhead out and they're putting Trinity in. That's not a red flag to people who profess to be Bible believing, God fearing men and women. That's what the Sadducees and the scribes do. They take things out and put things in. They don't want to believe it, they take it out. They want to believe what they want to believe, they'll put it in. Yet yeah, God said it's about men. Now notice here it says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees confess both. If you remember the story of Paul, where he sets the Sadducees against the Pharisees, uh, he says, for the resurrection, he's there because he's preaching Jesus. Not the resurrection of us, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And But he's mainly preaching Jesus Christ to the people, and they don't like it. So they're trying to get him killed, and he looks at them both and goes, wait a second, God gives them wisdom and says, play them against each other. So then he's like, Pharisees, I'm here because I, no, he just says, I'm here because I believe in the resurrection. And the Pharisees turn on the Sadducees, and the Sadducees start fighting the Pharisees, and he uses that. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees strongly disagree with each other, big time. But what happens for you, the Pharisees and Sadducees of today's that will fight each other, what happens when they see you? A Bible-believing, God-fearing man that's going to stand, or woman that's going to stand for the Word of God and absolute truth. They're going to live according to this Bible. They're going to have a healthy prayer life. Matthew 22, 34. Okay. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees, Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Now, the Pharisees are gathered together. But they also gathered together with the Sadducees and the scribes. They all united against Jesus Christ to put him to death. Your enemies, it's funny how today a lot of the enemies of the King James Bible, a lot of the, the fakers and the false people out there, they're uniting against Bible-believing Christian men and women. They're uniting against you. You're like, wait a minute, you guys were fighting each other and you disagreed on this. Now they're starting to agree so they can attack us. Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. Sometimes they'll disagree about something that's major. No, you're lost. No, you're lost. No, you're lost. And all of a sudden they're like, they see a true Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian man or woman, and they're like, they start teaming up saying, no, you're lost. Oh, congratulations. You made a good point there, brother. No, congratulations. You made a good point, brother. And you're like, but you said each other were lost. You're fighting among yourselves. He's lost. No, no, you're lost. Now they're uniting, saying, good point, brother. You give it to him. No, you can point over here, brother. You get it. It's like, what's going on? The enemies of the Lord, of his people, brothers and sisters in Christ, the body of Christ, even the Jewish people, you've got people out there that are attacking them, um, they're starting to unite as we get closer and closer to the catching way of the body of Christ. So we got this set up, Pharisees, traditions of men, self-righteous, and they hold themselves above men. They're, they're above the rules. Okay, They basically can do what they want. Um, you don't have to add to or subtract from Scripture, but the Pharisees are above that. They can do that. Um, the traditions of men, um, we've always used the word rapture. It's widely accepted among the body of Christ. Uh, traditions of men. You go in the Bible and say, if God wanted to use the word rapture, why isn't it in the Bible? Caught up is, I've used the word rapture, but my big thing today, brothers and sisters in Christ, is to point you to this, to stop 
being part of that false system that points you to the wisdom of men and the words of men to point you to the Word of God. Okay? So they hold the traditions of men above the Word of God. They're self-righteous. They're above the laws. They're above the rules. They're above the Word of God, basically. Sadducees, wisdom of this world. I can't understand it. It's gone. I can't understand the resurrection, so I don't believe in the resurrection. I don't understand how angels work or how angels can exist. Gone. Uh, spirit, you can't see the spirit. You can't touch the spirit. There's no such thing as spirits. Gone. Okay. I want to believe this. We're going to add it. Okay. So, going to verse 2. Going back to Matthew 16, verse 2. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today. Gotta wait for him to finish. For the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Now, now, you realize that a lot of people try to use Genesis 1.14 to justify um, looking at the stars to try to predict things. Okay, astrology. Not astrology, but I think that is. But basically it's rich, it's, it's evil and wicked. And they try to use that to justify um, predicting when Jesus is coming back. False prophets. Okay. But Jesus in himself here is setting the example and explaining what Genesis 1.14 means. So let's read Genesis 1.14. And God said, Let there be light in the firmaments of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, signs, for seasons, for days, and years. So will take the sign part and say, See signs so we can see the future. No, signs. Is it going to be a rainy day? Is it going to be cold today? Is it going to be windy? Okay, are we going to have a good day today, or is it going to be a bad day today, weather-wise? You can see the times, okay, for signs. Now, firmament, the region of the air, the sky or the heaven, from the ground to the top, firmaments, up there in the sky. So you look up there, and you can see if it's dark, because we, I know brothers and sisters, we see a lot. If you see dark clouds, you look at there and you say, it might rain today. I was going to do some, uh, I was going to paint the house, but it looks like it's going to rain today. Okay. Then for signs. That's what it's all about. You, there's people that they can look at the sky because they've lived in the area for a long time. They can look at the sky and say, uh oh, I think a tornado is forming. We got to get inside. We got to bunker down. Let's get everybody get ready. It looks like this is tornado weather. That's what it's talking about. And Jesus sets the example. We can see this, something that's so right in our face, but we ignore what's going on around us when we don't want to see something. When we want to believe what we want to believe and do what we want to do. Verse 4. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto him but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And I always have to throw that in there. 1 Corinthians 1.22 for Jews, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And where do you get that wisdom? James 1.5 If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But according to these uh, Trinity people, you, you, you don't go to God for wisdom. You don't go to God for wisdom. You go to man. Okay? They require a sign, a lot of them. They, don't, they won't believe this. They won't believe how the Godhead, how the, the Bible says this is the Godhead. You're to believe it. You don't understand it. You're supposed to have faith in the mysteries. The Bible says that. Um, and a lot of my other studies, I didn't write this down, but you're supposed to be faithful in the mysteries. You're supposed to have faith in things. Well, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. But there's going to be things we don't understand, brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're supposed to believe it because the Bible says it. We're supposed to use the wisdom of God. Say, Lord, give us wisdom. We're not supposed to be going to men for wisdom. You can learn from true Bible-believing, God-fearing men. Uh, Bible studies, I've, been, I've learned stuff from uh, 
sisters in Christ, brothers in Christ. They've shown me stuff. They've given me verses. I'm like, that's a good verse. I'm going to write that down and, and this. And But in the end, I always ask the Lord for wisdom. Lord, open my eyes. Let me understand what I'm doing. You know, Open the book to me, Lord. I, I'm confused about this, Lord. What do you think of that? And I ask the Lord to open my eyes and explain things to me. You always go to the Lord for wisdom. You always point someone to Jesus Christ. Okay? You always point people to the Word of God. That's why we say chapter and verse. I've had people say, this is what, this is what the Bible says, and I'm like, chapter and verse? Half the time, they show me and they're right. The other half the time, they realize that they're just passing on uh, what I call PWCs, a brother in Christ told me. Parrot won a cracker. They just parrot what someone told them. They don't ever take time to look it up. Okay. Always look it up for yourself. Taught my daughter that. She said that uh, strawberries are good for dogs. Strawberries are good for dogs. And I'm like, really? And she says, that's a fact. That's the word she said. That's a fact, an undeniable fact. It's good for dogs. And I'm like, I never heard of it. And I wasn't calling her a liar, but I said, so you looked this stuff up online and you did research on it and you know that only the strawberries are good for dogs? And she's like, no, my uncle told me that it's an undeniable fact. What was my daughter doing? She was being a PWC. So what I told my daughter to do, I said, hey, I'm not calling you a liar, but can you go look up online? She's got her own login on my computer and she goes and logs in and she looks all the information up and then she comes and gets me and we go look at it together and I'm like, you know what? You're right, but guess what? Now you know it's right. You're not just taking a man's word for it. That's what you're supposed to do, brothers and sisters. Verse 5, back to Matthew. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Uh, our first reaction, and mine is some, a lot, is fleshly. And if you keep feeding the Spirit, it becomes more like a whisper from the flesh saying, hit, hit this. And if you keep feeding the flesh, it's going to be like it's screaming at you big time. That's why you keep the flesh down. But they were thinking about bread. And remember what Jesus said, Matthew 4.4, 4, but, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What do the Pharisees and Sadducees do? They, they try to live by bread alone. They live by the flesh. They live by the world. And not by the Word of God. If it's something they don't like, they'll deceive you. I'm a Bible believer, but then they use traditions of men. They use words outside the Bible. Uh, Sadducees, oh, it's not supposed to be in the Bible because I don't want it to be in the Bible. I'm going to take it out. Today, there's over three, I think they said over 300 Bible perversions out there, and people can shop around. All these people trying to be Sadducees and scribes. I'm just going to shop around and I'm going to pick a Bible that I like that tells me what I want so I can believe what I want to believe and the number one reason is so I can keep my sin. I can continue in sin after I supposedly get saved. I can continue sinning. And I'm, I can go to heaven. Now don't get me wrong, I'm still a sinner. Saved by God's grace, not my faith, not by good works. But there's a changed life that comes after salvation. The King James Bible teaches a changed life after salvation. It's going to happen. You get saved, there's a changed life. Period. You might fight God. You might struggle with the Lord at first. But you truly love the Lord. You truly have the Holy Spirit in you. You truly have a love for His Word. And you want to obey it and live it. You're going to have a changed life. It's guaranteed. Okay? That's why a lot of these people shop around for these other Bibles. That's why you have a lot of fakes and frauds claiming to be Bible-believing teachers, Bible-believing Christian men and women that attack the changed life. They attack repentance as leading, leading to salvation. We're to live uh, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We're to live by this word. 
God's perfect written word. And today it comes to you in the King James Bible for English speaking people. Not by the traditions of men, not by the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of men, but by the word of God. Verse 8 in Matthew. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. I said, notice the word reason ye among yourselves. Uh, traditions of men and wisdom of the world. It's like having five men or women. They're all sitting down and they're like, Jesus' favorite pie is cherry pie. No, I believe Jesus' favorite pie is pumpkin pie. I don't know, pecan pie. And they're setting their reasoning among themselves, and the Bible is just sitting on the table in front of them. Uh, why don't you pick up the Bible and use the Bible? Now, I know I'm using something like pie because I still want to throw up something major out there. I want to do something simple. But just open the Bible and find out. No, no, no. we got to sit here and debate. we got to argue, and we got to, you know, just... Reason among ourselves. Okay, why didn't they just ask Jesus? He's right there. Verse 8. I think we did that one. Uh, verse 9. Do ye not yet understand? i got to stop for a second. But that's, when I use the thing about the pie, but that has to do with everything. The Godhead, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, eternal security, dispensational teaching, the Bible version issue. It's all about word of mouth. We've got to reason among ourselves and use our own intellect. They don't like to use the word of God. But I know that my brothers and sisters of Christ out there that love the word of God, you do your best to use this. But even I have gotten drawn away from this into debating and arguing. And I work so hard to stick to the word of God. It's not always easy with all the temptation and them trying to drag you away. Verse 9, do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Uh, I put down here Holy Ghost to open the scriptures. But not only that, but like I said, the Bible's sitting right there on the table. Do you not remember we're supposed to be going off the Bible as our final authority? Do you not remember the Bible says you don't cast your pearls before swine? Do you not to argue with the lost people about the Bible? You know, Jesus is talking to him, saying, don't you remember what I did? Verse 10, neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets you took of. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? So then when they listened to Jesus, because Jesus is talking... Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. When you realize that you've lost track of this, God's perfect written word, and you turn back to it, you go, oh, that's what the Lord means. I got so distracted by people, by the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And when you turn back to this, and the Holy Spirit's in you, it opens you opens the book to you in all truth and you're like I need to just stick to this but every so often you get straight to the side by argument and debating by doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees you do not want to do that oh and I, I, this, this is the way I said it notice when they stop reasoning among themselves and listen to the word of Jesus they understood when people today stop reasoning among themselves and actually start reading the book, studying it, believing it, living it, then they truly understand. Now, doctrines of the Pharisees, traditions of men, I'm going to go over it again, traditions of men, they're self-righteous, they're above people. Doctrines of the Sadducees, and I always put uh, scribes kind of in with them too, because it's all about wisdom of men, they ignore scripture. Uh, they don't believe in the resurrection. They ignore scripture. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in spirits. Why? Because they can't understand it. And if they can't understand it, then it's wrong. It shouldn't be there. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Sisera Philippi, he asked, asked his disciples, saying, Whom did men say that I, the Son of Man, am? I put down traditions of men. He's asking them, What do men say? I think he's doing this for a reason. 
What do men say that I am? 14. And they said, in other words, when I put down tradition of men, in other words, it's about what men think. Now, 14, though. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Wisdom of men. They're the ones trying to figure out who Jesus is. So many people today, traditions of men, they have the Bible right here, it's available, it's still available, they're trying to outlaw it in even states in America, it's outlawed in a lot of countries, especially the King James Bible, yet they won't use the Bible, they keep going off of what men, traditions of men, what men say, okay? And they also go off the wisdom of men, men make good arguments, but they're not using the Bible. Well, it's a good argument. They kind of make sense. They're using their own wisdom and intellect. But let's see what happens when you have the Holy Spirit and you use the word, the word God. I'm using it as a simile because I'm applying it to us for instruction and righteousness. But what does Peter say? 15, he saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? It's personal now. Jesus' one-on-one -on -one relationship, your personal walk with the Lord, he's going to open the book. He's going to say, you had this question, the answer's right there. And you're going to be like, I read this a million times. And now when I have that question, God opens your eyes, and there's your answer. But who say you that I am? 16, verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He didn't look at him and go, oh, psh. Peter, you're so smart. Your PhD, your PhDs, your titles, um, that you're above everybody, and your traditions of men, wisdom of the world, that's how you knew, because you're just a smart man, Peter. No, Jesus set the example throughout, and you'll see it throughout the New Testament, God gives you that wisdom. When God shows me something I get excited to do a quick video or I tell a sister and brother of Christ about it, it's because I'm excited God showed me this. It wasn't me that found it. It's not my intellect. God showed it to me. John 16, 13, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, my wisdom, my intellect, but whosoever He shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. All right. I kind of got that a little wrong, but that's still a good point. It's not my intellect. It's the Holy Spirit's intellect. The Holy Spirit is what brings us into all truth. The Bible talks about the gospel, the people that fight the true gospel, um, these uh, faith alone, easy believism crowd, and the works-based crowd, you know, good works to be saved. Uh, the Bible says it's hid to them. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to understand the Word of God. Look back to uh, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. It can't happen if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you. But Jesus is asking, what does the world say? And you get to hear the world's wisdom. Then he asks, who do you say I am? talking about the, to the, the uh, apostles. And when Peter tells him who he is, the truth, like being right on, it wasn't Peter's wisdom, it's God that showed it to him. Verse 18, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The rock that's talking about this rock is Jesus, because what did he ask Peter he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And because God has shown this to you, I am the rock, and I'm going to use you. And he did use Peter. Verse 19, And I will give unto thee, to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever shalt, thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whosoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Okay. Notice another thing here real quick. Peter was focused on Jesus. Not the traditions of men, not the wisdom of men, not the wisdom of this world, because they said, these people say this. 
But he listened to the Lord, God, showing him who Jesus was. Remember this. He's focused on Jesus. We need to be focused on the Word of God. But what happens when we take our focus off that? Verse 20, Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. A lot of the prophecies in the Old Testament put the word, the word of God. How many times do we show people the Word of God and they don't like it? Okay, he's showing this to everybody. Remember, Peter just said, Thou art Christ. Um, I want to say it right. Thou art, Christ, art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's focused on Jesus. He's listening to God. You've got people that are focused, like me sometimes. I'm focused on the Word of God because God helps me. But when I start looking over here and people start telling me stuff, especially when I was newly saved, I made a big mess a lot with Scripture when I was newly saved, the babe in Christ. So what's uh, Peter's reaction? Jesus is saying this is prophecy being fulfilled. He is God. It's His Word. He's saying this is going to happen. What does Peter do? Verse 22, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. I believe he was using the wisdom of men and the traditions of men. There's no way they treat you like that. They, they wouldn't do that. Our traditions, that would go against tradition. That would go against the law. They wouldn't do that. Wisdom of men. Uh, I can stop that from happening. I don't care. If God says it's going to happen. Man, I can stop it. I won't allow it to happen. He basically called Jesus a liar, too. And Jesus said it will happen. Peter's like, uh, be it far from me. It's not going to happen. How many times do you try to preach the, the Bible to them and people have that same attitude? Uh, the Bible, it's, it says Godhead with a capital G. It's a title for God. Uh, we're not supposed to be using the, the Trinity. Okay? Be it far from me, I love the Trinity. I, uh, it's, it's not, I'm not going to use the Godhead, it's the Trinity. It's not, you know, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer, call upon the name of the Lord to save you. And when God saves you, that's salvation. God's grace that saves you, that's salvation. No, 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 it's my faith. Be it far from me, because this is God, God's word. Be it far from me. They're rebuking God, saying, no, you got it wrong, God. Your word has it wrong. It's Trinity. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the only person of the Godhead. Be it far from me. Lord, God, you're wrong. Your word's wrong. It should be God in three persons. The Holy Spirit's supposed to be a person. Uh, G, uh, God the Father's supposed to be a person. Be it far from me. And yes, the word is far from them because they go away, they turn their back on the word. So Peter, I believe, looked back at his own wisdom and intellect, the traditions of men, and the law, couldn't hear the law. There's no way that that happened. If you've ever looked into it, when they put Jesus to death, I forgot how many, but it was like 12 to 16 laws that they broke in doing that. Verse 23 in Matthew. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, the word of God, but those that be of men. The word Trinity, it's tradition, but the church, not all the church, that's a lie when you hear him say, the, all the church fathers accepted it, that's a lie. Okay, Not everybody accepted the term Trinity. They used Godhead. There's a lot of them out there that use Godhead. Okay? That believe in the Word of God. But notice Jesus' reaction. Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter's not law. I don't believe Peter's going to hell or anything. But he told Peter to get thee behind me, Satan. That's how God feels about it. Even if you're a truly saved, Bible-believing Christian man or woman, and you turn your back on the Word and you start adding the traditions of men, that's how God's attitude is. Get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, for, thou, not, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. These people that stand for the Trinity so hardcore, 
they turn their back on the true gospel, eternal security, pre time of Jacob's trouble, the Bible teaches dispensational teaching. Um, even if you're saved, God's going to have that attitude with you. If you start turning your back on truth and God's word, you start going to the words of men, God's attitudes could be behind me, Satan. For thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. When I was a false Christian, and I was PWC's, parrot one a cracker, believing whatever anybody told me, I was an offense to the Lord. I wasn't a Christian, I was a fake and a fraud. Okay? Now that I'm saved, I've made some mistakes, and God's like, I'm not saying he's going to be so mean to always say, get thee behind me, Satan, get thee behind me, Satan. But God's like, uh, you're wrong here. And if we keep fighting God on everything, when it comes to truth, sanctification, we become offensive to the Lord. We're not to savor the things that be of men. We're not to hold the traditions of men above the Word of God. That's why I, over the years, I'm not talking about just a few years, I'm talking about back to when, before this, the King James Bible was translated in English. They were trying to introduce, and I've got books, and we'll look at one of them, trying to introduce the traditions of men way back then. Okay. Mainly it was the Catholic Church, but after, you know, the King James Bible came out, they couldn't stop it. I uh, came across the Dewey Reams finally, that added to my collection. But it, it came out before, a couple years before, 1607 I think it was, or 1606. Um, and they tried everything to indoctrinate traditions of men, getting you to use words outside the Bible to pull you away from God's Word. Because that's what Satan wants. 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Okay? Deny the traditions of men when it goes against the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with having traditions. You know, once a year I have family come over. I'm just using this as an example. Once a year I have family come over and uh, we do a big barbecue and we talk and we see how all the family's doing because we're spread out and see how people are doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as it doesn't go against the Word of God. And you don't hold that tradition above the Word of God. In other words, you don't try to take away or subtract or add to the Word of God by the tradition. Um, you get married. I hopefully will be getting married. Um, the Lord has blessed me. Uh, once a year you do an anniversary. I hear people talking about how they do an anniversary. Uh, it's a, That's considered a tradition. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as it's not going against the Word of God. Tradition, when you deny tradition of men when it goes against the Word of God, you deny, well, everybody's always used Trinity. Uh, what does the Bible use? Did God want the word Trinity as a title, or did he want the word Godhead as a title? Oh, well, you know, uh, it's, it's always been post or mid-trib, you know. This pre-time of Jacob's trouble, uh, everybody's always taught. It's, it's only new. It hasn't been taught, and it's a lie. It's been taught clear back to there was evidence in the 300 A.D., uh, the Catholic Church condemning that teaching, so the teaching had to be back then if it was being condemned. I mean, it's, I know it's a hard concept for the post and mid-tribs, but they always go back to John Nelson Darby, and you got to deny the traditions of men. It's not about what John Nelson Darby says. It's about what does God's Word say. Uh, deny your limited wisdom and the wisdom of this world, and relying on the Holy Spirit to open the Word of God to you, asking the Lord for wisdom. you got to deny yourself. Um, there's also, I got, I corrected a couple brothers in Christ, and they went crazy, they went nuts. And you, when it comes to denying yourself, sometimes it also means, hey, you got to deny your flesh. You got to say, the Word of God says this, I got to give it up. I got to do this. I'm not supposed to be doing that. I got to deny myself. And notice there, I always use this verse because a brother used it, um, Take up his cross and follow me. I didn't write this verse down, but on, in the Bible it talks about um, pick up your cross daily. 
You deny your flesh, you deny your wisdom, you deny your traditions when they go against the Word of God, and you pick up your cross and you start living for the Lord. If you believe in His Word, you love His Word, you live His Word. What happens when you fall into sin? You get tempted by the traditions of men, by the wisdom of men, by your flesh. You drop the cross. That's why the Bible is talking about you pick up your cross daily. Daily. Um, a sister in Christ told me, and I didn't get to see this video, where Peter Ruckman is talking about that if he was judged on his works, uh, by the moment he got up out of bed and walked to the kitchen, he, he'd be going to hell in a heartbeat. He'd jump right on in if he was being judged by his works. you got to pick up your cross daily. We're going to fall. We're going to be dropping our cross every day. We gotta keep picking it up. We have to keep denying ourselves. Mm -hmm. Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Um, I always try to bring up the blind man that the parents did not want to be kicked out of the synagogue. Okay, John 9, 21 through 22. But by what means he now seeth, we know not, or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of, a, he is of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. The parents were brought in and asked, was he blind, what happened and everything? And this is why they told him, just go back to his son, ask him, he's of age. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Uh, what happened to who, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whoso shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. How many people today are wanting to be part of their group, they're part of uh, a cult, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Catholics, and they fear being put out of their social club, their circle. So they're like, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to make waves. I don't want to offend people. You know, I don't want to cause division. That's the biggest thing of these professing Christians today. I don't want to cause division, yet Jesus said himself that he came not to bring peace, but a sword. What does a sword do? It divides. What does this book do? It divides. What is a Christian supposed to be? It's supposed to be separate from the lost world. You get saved, there's a divide. You're over here now with the brothers and sisters of Christ, the lost world's over here. You're not over here anymore. There's a divide. And whoever shall lose his life for my sake. Like I said, when you get saved, you're going to suffer. If you're truly saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing, I had a sister in Christ that I love with all my heart, that she's worried about not having any rewards. If you're truly saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing, you're going to suffer for Jesus Christ. And she does. I see it when we talk about her stories and what she's experienced in life. She suffered for Jesus Christ. And she's worried about not being able to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And there's other people out there, brothers and sisters of Christ, that worry about the same. I worried about it at one time. But start doing something about it right here and right now. Start living for the Lord now. Make your spiritual sacrifices. Follow the Bible. Allow God to clean up your life. Make your stands. Um, the lost world's going to treat you bad because of it. It's going to happen. But if you're about traditions of men and the wisdom of the world, it's all about we all have to agree to disagree. We all have to get along. we got to stop, you know, being divisive. Verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in His glory of His Father and His angels, and then He shall reward every man according to His work. If you follow the traditions of men and or the wisdom of this world over the word of God, is that a good work or a bad work? Because remember it says you're going to be judged by your works, period. You will be judged by your good and bad works as a Christian. 
at the judgment seat of Christ. Your rewards. Okay? People just think that uh, talking to a sister in Christ about how people think it's going to be a walk in a park. We get to stand up there and he's going to throw our works on the fire. The bad's going to burn away. We've got our good. That's all that matters is the good. And we don't have to face the bad things we did. As a Christian, you're, you're, everything, be everything before you got saved, erased. You're saved now. God will forgive you of the sins that you commit to the time you're in heaven and you go to the uh, judgment seat of Christ, but you will still, they will still be brought to light, I guess is a great way to say it. They'll still be brought to light. These are the bad things you did. Everybody gets to hear it. Here's the good things you did. Everybody gets to hear it. It gets thrown on the fire. Good things remain. Bad things get burnt up. It's not going to be a fun time. Okay? I'm not looking forward to it because I know I've made some big mistakes, especially as a newly saved Christian. And I've got brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are newly saved, and they think they're not saved because they are just making a mess of their life. They're struggling with submitting themselves to the Word of God. They're struggling in their prayer life. Well, some of them say, "I don't." It's almost like I don't have a prayer life. You need to get that. You need to get that prayer life figure, figured out. You need to start talking to the Lord all the time. You need to stay in His Word. And you want to have more? I think what I said was that one time I just said, I wish, I, I, I was just blessed. I told the Lord I'd be blessed if I had to wash the feet of everybody that ever came into the city or into heaven. That's when I was newly saved. Now that I know more about the Bible and I know what we're supposed to strive for, I tell, I say, I'm, I'm trying to get the uh, more good works than bad. We're going to have stubble, wood, hay, and stubble, but I'm trying to do my best to please God and to obey God and have more good works. I'm doing my best, and that should be your goal, and that's what you should strive for every day. Oh, right over my head. I don't know if that got on camera. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Okay. Now I understand it's talking about uh, when Jesus is raised from the dead, the spiritual kingdom. But part of me wants to say, could this also be talking about the Apostle John? He got to see the Lord coming down he, he's, uh, God revealed Reve the book of Revelation to John to write for us. He got to see it. He got to see everything. The time of Jacob, the catching away of the body of Christ, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jesus coming back in his glory, the thousand year millennial kingdom, and what happens afterwards. God revealed all that to him. He got to see it. So could this also be talking about John, the future prophecy by Jesus Christ of what he would reveal to John? So, I want to end this with, don't go after the traditions of men, don't go after the, root, I say the rudiments of the world, but the wisdom of the world, uh, the wisdom of men, don't rely on your own intellect. When you are confused or you don't ha have the answers, go to God first. There's nothing wrong with asking a brother and sister in Christ, but take it to the Lord in prayer. I just, people are like, I don't have a prayer life. Well, you come to me, they come to me, they go to Brother Brian, they go to other people that are out there that I believe are saved, and they're asking questions about the Bible, asking questions about the Bible. Take it to the Lord first. Say, Lord, help me with this, Lord. And he might say, ask this brother in Christ. He might just show you the answer and reveal it to you right then and there. There's no, it's hard for me to say this, but there was a time in my life that I didn't have much of a prayer life. Okay, and the biggest reason people, I believe, that people don't have much of a prayer life is the flesh is overwhelming them. The world is overwhelming them. Lost family members, friends, um, you know, the flesh, they're struggling, they're trying to allow God to clean up their life, and they're still going through that process. And the, some people that have fallen away, they're trying to get back with the Lord. But you got to get that walk going again, brothers and sisters in Christ. You've got to get that prayer life healthy and strong again. Take it to the Lord. I'm struggling with fixing something in the house. It has nothing to do with the Word of God. I'm struggling with fixing something in the house. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, help me with this. Lord, thank you for saving me. I could have hurt myself this way. 
uh, truck almost hit us on my trips. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for your prayer, because the truck almost hit us and pushed us into oncoming traffic. It was scary. I thank the Lord. First thing I thought was, oh, Lord, like, are you going to, you know, because it happens so fast, you really can't get anything else out, but you wanted, like, in your head, you're going to say, oh, Lord, save me. But all you get out is, oh, Lord, and then the instance, uh, the situation's over with. Your first response should always be to go to God in prayer. So, I want to leave this verse with brothers and sisters in Christ. Proverbs 11.1 1, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. I think this goes along with um, Revelation 3.16 So then, because they are, thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Okay? Bible believers professing Bible believers that put traditions of men above the Word of God, uh, rely on men's wisdom, the wisdom of the world, and not asking God for the wisdom. Um, Got to get back to that verse. It's a good one. Uh, they're an abomination to the Lord. They're false balance, okay? They're supposed to be going off the word of the Lord, not traditions of men. There's some traditions you can have. We've already talked about that a little bit. But when you hold a 100% tradition and claim to be a Bible believer, it's a false balance. You're not a Bible believer. It's not. There's nothing wrong with asking a brother and sister in Christ, I, hey, I don't quite understand this. What, uh, can you help me with this? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're relying 100% on the wisdom of men, and not asking God for wisdom, that's a false balance. Okay? The true weight there that's talking about, I believe, but for this uh, teaching, but a just weight is His delight. You can delight the Lord if you rely on Him for wisdom. You can delight the Lord, have some traditions, but you don't hold the traditions of men above the Word of God. You can still sin and fall into temptation and fail and fall, fall at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me, repent. Your heart can be right with the Lord, and it's His delight. All right. Don't fall into the trap of the traditions of men and women, the traditions of this world, the wisdom of this world. Don't, don't fall into it, brothers and sisters of Christ. Stay strong, stay in prayer, stay in the Word of God, make sure that the Word of God is your final authority. I'm praying for you, please continue to pray for me, and I will see you in the next video.